Okay, I think we, we're getting really close to our and the number of uh, people who have signed on, so I think we're close enough to get started. This is Catherine Lavoy, and and I'll um, I'll start then. Um, okay. Well, the creation of the HABS program in 1933 was really sort of the culmination of numerous ideas and movements that had been brewing for many years, um, but they really lacked a unified national perspective and oversight. Um, for example, members of the American Institute of Architects or the AIA, had lobbied for a national archive of our architectural heritage. And architects trained in the Beaux-Arts School had long created drawings of historic buildings as a means of learning about architectural forms and adopting them for, their, for use in their own design. Um, but many did so for greater purposes as well, and that was the preservation of colonial building forms through the production of measured drawings assembled in folio volumes and often accompanied by photographs. Although these were very valuable, they generally lacked historical information, um, nor were they produced using a consistent methodology or format. Um, moreover, there was no central repository for the documentation, which would enable public accessibility, but also enable the comparison of building forms and styles nationwide thus enhancing our understanding of American architecture. And that's why the tripartite agreement um, that joined together uh, the National Park Service or HABS with the AIA and the Library of Congress to establish HABS as a permanent program in 1934 stated, and I quote, the scattered surveys that have heretofore been made through the efforts of local organizations and individual enthusiasm have yielded heterogeneous results with considerable duplication and have been of little practical value to the general public. A comprehensive and continuous national survey is the logical concern of the federal government." End quote. So starts HABS. Okay, so um, HABS was intended to fulfill numerous purposes. Thank you. Um, most importantly, the HABS collection was intended to represent American building forms of all types and from all regions of the country. As was stated in the original proposal for the program in 1933, the HABS records were to reflect a complete resume of the builder's art, from the monumental and high style to the vernacular and utilitarian. Regionally and ethnically derived building forms were then, and still are, of particular interest to HABS. In addition to HABS recording projects of significant sites and structures, documentation generally comes to us from SHPOs. And through donation, or by undertaking recording projects to HABS standards. Despite the popular belief, HABS is interested not only in the documentation of National Historic Landmarks, but in sites at all levels of significance, including state and local. Contributions of any or all elements, including measured drawings, written histories, and large format photographs that meet the Secretary of the Interior standards are greatly appreciated. Um, secondly, the HABS collection was intended as a database of architectural details that could be used in restoration projects, um, so therefore identifying and providing appropriate period-specific architectural plans and details um, was a consideration of the AIA, as well as um, details for new building designs that utilized, excuse me, utilized historical motifs. Um, and having a national database is useful because it allows for comparisons within regions and on a national scale, thus enabling us to do things like trace patterns of the diffusion of building styles and types. Um, the example that you see here on the screen is from the early HABS state survey from Massachusetts, where the, uh, the team members uh, were able to use their survey work to identify building typologies, um, as you can see, both in terms of typical plans, floor plans, and of uh, different stylistic patterns, and then record a representative sampling of that. 
in terms of inspiration, uh, there were num numerous uh, different things that cr helped to create the HABS program. And I think, first of all, was the colonial revival movement. Um, HABS was, in fact, part of a groundswell of interest in collecting and preserving information, artifacts, and structures relating to America's colonial past. Uh, there were numerous institutions created during that, that era, such as the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, and Colonial Williamsburg, all things that we, that we know very well about. Um, they provided models for the preservation and interpretation of our architectural heritage. And as the first federal preservation program, HABS was among these founding organizations, establishing methodologies, methodologies excuse me, such as architectural survey and the idea of about comprehensive recording that was to become standard practice. The colonial revival movement was motivated in part by the perceived need to mitigate the effects of rapidly vanishing uh, historic resources, re excuse me, resources upon America's architectural history and heritage. Oops, excuse me, I advanced too quickly. Um, at the time, there was a perception that we were losing colonial era structures to decay and redevelopment. And it was thought that we needed to preserve what we could of these historic resources, but then create a record of those re important resources that could not be saved. And thus, the need to record endangered architecture really became the call to action for establishing the HAPS program. Um, the other factor was the Beaux-Arts tradition of architectural education, which was popular during that time, whereby architects learned their trade by copying and thus committing to memory historical patterns and motifs. Um, so that was a, another motivation. The art of delineation prescribed by the Beaux-Arts tradition is also apparent in the early Habs drawings, as the example shows here. Um, so currently, Habs' mission basically is first to create a public archive of information relating to our architectural and also engineering, industrial, and landscape history through the production of measured drawings, written histories, and large format photographs. Uh, Habs is also intended to be a clearinghouse for mitigation and other donations um, to the collection, thus serving as basically the liaison um, to the Library of Congress. Our job is also to create standard setting or example documentation and to field test new recording methodologies and technologies um, within the context of the Secretary of the Interior Standards um, particularly those um, for verifiability and long-term permanence. And then lastly, um, to educate the next generation of historical architects and historians through our summer recording program and other initiatives such as the Charles E. Peterson and the Lester B. Holland Measured Drawing Prizes. Um, those prizes are intended to increase awareness knowledge and appreciation of historic sites, structures, and landscapes throughout the United States while adding to the permanent Habs hair and house collections at the Library of Congress and to encourage participation basically among students. Uh, the Historic American Engineering Record, or HAIR, um, was created in 1969 um, as an adjunct to Habs to focus on the recording of industrial and engineering components of our built environment. So while HABS was created through a tripartite agreement that included the American Institute of Architects, HAIR was sponsored by the American Society of Civil Engineers and later joined by four other engineering societies um, and has its own particular constituency. HABS did record industri industry prior to HAIR's formation, but it was mostly of small-scale sites and structures, um, like the mill building that appears on the left side of your screen. Um, and even the early recording of sites at, at the formation of HAIR in 1969 generally took a more architectural approach, focusing on the building rather than really the process of taking place within. Um, but as HAIR matured, the focus turned to the interpretation of industrial processes, 
making them understandable to the layperson through drawings that diagram the procedures taking place. Um, HAIR also records engineering structures, um, not just factories and buildings, um, such as bridges and even NASA's space test rocket stand, um, and also includes a very active maritime recording program. The Historic American Landscape <laughs> Survey, or HALS, was formed more recently in 2000 to bring attention to the value of historical and cultural landscapes through an agreement with the American Society of Landscape Architects. Again, have did some landscape recording prior to the formation of HALS, but not in a comprehensive manner and generally through the production of site plans as a means of establishing the environmental setting for historic structures. Um, an exception to this was an initiative by the Massachusetts Office in HAB in the 1930s to record formal drawings, which examples are represented here on the left. And while site plans are often included in the HAB's drawing set, uh, in some cases landscape features were greatly overlooked, um, as shown an example on the right where the buildings appear to float in midair. Um, HAL today uses new methodologies and, and technologies to record not just small but large-scale uh, landscapes that are presented through sections, using panoramic views, and even incorporating the use of color drawings when needed to differentiate uh, in plant materials and other features. In terms of HAB's hair HAL methodology, we maintain the old traditions while applying new ones when appropriate. Careful hand measuring and field noting still form the backbone of the recording programs as the best means of obtaining accurate information and fully engaging with the resource, that is, observing its form, structure, and style, and looking for clues as to age and building technology. While we still produce measure drawings on mylar or archival bond paper, we utilize new technologies in their production, such as high-definition laser scanning to record large-scale structures or those that pose challenges to recording, such as decaying or endangered sites. Laser scanning does have its drawbacks, however. The point cloud or laser transmission cannot read or record elements that are hidden for, from view, for example. Um, as shown by the, the Statue of Liberty drawing uh, on the far left. It's also very cumbersome for use in creating four plans, which are arguably the most important element that needs to be represented through measured drawings. And due to the pixelized nature of the cloud, um, details are also generally more quickly and effectively measured by hand. We also use now 3D modeling mostly for the recording of complex engineering and maritime structures that are difficult to understand or decipher as this rocket test fan. Um, so the modeling allows us to slice through the image to create a multitude of drawings um, that are used for interpretive purposes. Again, these technologies, 3D model laser scanning, are tools that are applied to the production of measured drawings. Um, so that, as you can see in this evolution, that's sort of our end product because the drawings are clearly more easily understood by the layperson and they're also um, sustainable long term as um, Anne will be explaining to you shortly. Um, color photography is also a, a part of Habs Hair House recording, um, particularly where color is an important element of the site as shown here in this uh, interesting structure that's uh, built from colored glass from bottles. Um, and we, we generally take at least one color image of every site, generally showing the building its environmental set setting. I wanted to point that out because I don't think it's universally understood that the color is part of the Habs Hair House um, collection. The guiding principles behind Habs Hair House uh, recording are our standards and guidelines. Um, first of all, the Secretary of the Interior's standards outline the requirements for the production of documentation 
and basically they include four key principles. First, that the documentation should adequately convey what is significant or important about the structure. Second, that the documentation be prepared from reliable sources. Um, this is where the field notes for the measured drawings come into play, ensuring the accuracy of the drawings themselves. Um, with regard to the photographs, reliability and accuracy is supplied by the negative. And with historical reports, it's offered by the use of primary sources and um, footnotes and bibliography um, that give source material. Third is durability and the use of standard sizes and format. The long-term durability of the collection is the, a primary concern to ensure that the records are available for future generations. Um, and this is why the, the Library of Congress currently does not accept computer-aided drafting or laser scanning files for digital photographs. And standard sizes and formats are necessary to, for ease of storage at the library and to provide a common language for the production of documentation and for its use by the researcher. Um, and then fourth is the requirement that the documentation be presented in a manner that is clear and concise so that it is easily understood and used by the general public. The Habs Hair Health guidelines are basically the how-to guides for the actual production of the drawings, history, and photographs in order to meet the program's requirements. And they are available for download via our website. Um, we all, I also wanted to mention that we have the newly created HABS field guide for non-architecture professionals. Um, this guide provides a step-by-step step -step instructions for producing floor plans and elevations. Um, but it also talks about field observations or how to read a building to discover clues about age and style and building construction. Uh, the other tool that we have available via our website are sample projects, which show documentation packages at various levels of recording, and those are available for viewing uh, online, too. We have the, the benefit of our partnership with the Library of Congress that, that stores our documentation for us and also presents our collection online. Uh, the, the online collection the, the whole digitization process started back in the 1990s. Uh, they, the Library of Congress initially got a grant from Shell Oil, uh, and the idea behind the grant was to digitize a collection that had exceptional educational value for students. Uh, the library chose HAIR as the collection for that pilot project, and the HAIR collection was one of the first um, collections at the library to be presented online. Um, the online collection provides access and has opened up new audiences to a collection that was previously only available in the prints and photographs reading room. Uh, the power of, of having a digital collection is that the, the collection, the online collection currently gets about 50,000 visitors a month, viewing approximately 800,000 pages on the website, which when you compare to prior to digitization, we had about 3,000 visitors each year that would go to the reading room to visit the collection in person. That kind of speaks to the power of, of digital. Um, high resolution, high quality tips of photographs and drawings are available online. The entire collection is copyright free, so you can download them, use them in publications, use them on your website um, as you uh, see fit. Um, the website underwent a substantial redesign in 2011. That was the, the first major redesign of the site since its inception in the 90s. Um, the new website uses the Had Care House database that the National Park Service maintains as the sole data source for the collection, which improved um, its searchability and the quality of the data that's available. Uh, the Had Care House staff has spent a good deal of time building out item level metadata for all of our photographs. Uh, we have subject keyword terms for each survey, as well as significant names associated with each survey, which include uh, owners of houses and buildings, architects, landscape designers, all of those kinds of things have all been um, built out by Hats Hair House staff, and they're all searchable. 
And just as a side note, the, the American Memory site that was launched in the 90s is still up on the library's website. It is no longer being maintained or updated. Um, but the, the website is still there. So the new um, URL for the website is up at the top of that slide. I want to get the most updated information and have you know, more search capabilities, please use the new website. Um, the also kind of a new feature, we used to have um, the, the FERC reports were not available in PDF, you had to download them page by page, which was a pain. Uh, now the website has PDFs that are available for download. All of those PDFs are OCR'd so that you can um, search within the document for you know, whatever terms you might be looking for. Um, in 2010, we have our transmittal guidelines that are posted online, which detail um, what kinds of things you need to send to us when you're sending us documentation. And one of the things that we started requiring in 2010 were PDFs of historical reports. So that way we can transmit those PDFs directly to the library, and they can be posted online relatively quickly compared to if, if, if we don't receive an electronic copy, that physical paper has to go into a very long scanning queue at the library, and it might be before you would see that documentation online. By requiring the electronic copy, you can very quickly update survey as you receive them. Um, the online access has allowed the House Fair House collection to be moved off-site from the reading room on Capitol Hill to a purpose-built storage facility at Fort Meade um, that the library owns. It has incredible storage, and it reduces wear and tear on the collection, so it allows us to have even better preservation of the original uh, archival drawings and photographs going forward. And this is a side note. Anybody who has submitted had care house documentation, you know, there's very specific guidelines on how to label things. Uh, in this illustration, we have, you know, we ask you to label the negative in a certain way and then insert the negative into the, the negative sleeve in a certain way and then label the negative sleeve in the upper right hand corner. Um, it's because of the way that it's stored at the library. Um, the negative is inserted into the negative sleeve with the emulsion facing away from any seams. And that's because the, any kind of air and contaminants that are going to damage the emulsion are going to come in through those seams. And you know, over a couple of hundred years, having the emulsion facing away from the seam actually does make a big difference when you're preserving the negative long term. So we're not trying to, you know, it's, you know we have very, it's, it's for the preservation of the collection. And you know, while we have digitized collection online, we still require paper for long-term durability that's required by Secretary of Interior standards. Um, so digital preservation at this point is still kind of a, a big unknown. Um, the success stories that we have for, for digital preservation are few and far between and have only lasted a few years. Um, you know, we have a preservation standard of 500 years. We can say with really great confidence, negative a drawing printed out of mylar and vellum and archival paper will last 500 years. With digital, you know, it's, it's unknown. Um, one of the stats that's on the slide, the um, computer world had an article about the, the digital dark age that may be coming because um, we're not doing a good job of digital preservation. And online storage reliability will need to increase by a factor of 1 billion or a 50% chance of files being usable after just 100 years. And our preservation standard is 100 years. And a lot of um, archives that or have, have a commercial function, like the Internet Archive, while they're digitizing books, they're not throwing those books away. They're keeping those books and putting them in archival storage. And here's kind of one of the reasons why. We, we say digital preservation is uh, a problem. Most of you have probably seen uh, error, error messages like this in the past. Um, just to, you know, again, to reiterate the point, on the right side of the screen is um, a digitized image of a negative from the 1930s that was pulled out of the collection. It still looks perfect. 
on the left side of the screen, those are some examples of technologies that have existed for only the last 30 years or so, and all of those are now obsolete. And if you have, you know, a, a big Wang disk, you know, good luck finding a computer that's going to be able to read that file. Um, and also, all of the digital technologies are machine dependent, meaning you need a machine, a software, a hardware to be able to read and interpret those files. Where you look at the negative on the right side of the screen, I can look at that with my naked eye and say, yes, there's the image. I can see it. I don't need a machine to help me interpret it. Um, so here's some of the things that we have to think about when we think about, okay, if a, a digital object is going to be sustainable through time, um, what are the things that we need to worry about? A resiliency of a file format. That's why TIFF is kind of when you're talking about a, a digital preservation master file format. TIFF is is kind of what most archives use. It has a great resiliency against errors, and when errors occur in the file, sometimes you can recover those files. Um, another huge concern that I spoke to before is but media degradation. You know, all of the hardware and software, the obsolescence cycles for most of those are three to five years. Um, that's very, very quick. And, and most archives traditionally have been used to the idea that they can have a preservation master that lasts a minimum of 100 years. They can kind of store it and forget it. So digital preservation is a whole new paradigm for archives to deal with. And even media that, that has been labeled as being archival, like example, gold, CDs and DVDs, um, when they first came out several years ago, they were marketed as, as a preservation master media format that they would last 100 years. Well, now that they've been out for a while, um, accelerating testing and, and as you know, basically that they only last three to 10 years. So even things that we think when they're introduced are going to be archival, you know, it, it ends up not to be so, and, and we really haven't solved a lot of these problems yet with digital preservation. Uh, another big barrier to preservation is, is cost. Uh, digital storage is exponentially more expensive than storing uh, a, a negative or a drawing. Um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences did a study a couple years ago. Um, it, they estimate the cost to preserve one movie on film is about $1,000 a year. The cost to preserve that same movie digitally is $12,000 a year. Um, and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, uh, they're the people who run the Oscars, so they have a, a pretty extensive uh, film archive of all the movies that have ever been nominated for an Oscar. In order to preserve those um, movies long term, they are actually converting anything that's produced digitally onto film masters. And the film is what they're working really hard to preserve, not the digital file. Um, and there still is just a like lack of industry standards. You know, our standard for half hair house photography is large format, and there is no standard for a born digital large format uh, equivalent. Um, and, and the industry, you know, digital is kind of a moving target, and, and it really still is. And so it's hard for us to do look be kind of be setting the standard when there really isn't one in the industry. Um, I know that the, kind of to reiterate, you know, why do we use large format photography? Um, this is an example of, you know, an image collected on an iPhone, an image that's collected on actually a really pretty high-end digital camera versus an image that's captured on a large format film. Um, the level of detail that you get from large format film is just digital is only now uh, approaching the kind, the amount of information and the quality of information that you get on a large format film. Um, so now we can really start looking, now that the, the digital industry has kind of met the, the quality of large format, we can really start looking at, okay, well, what does it mean to accept more digital photography? So we're, we're looking at it, but there's still a lot of things that we have to, to look at. So, um, the Secretary of Interior standards number two is, is that any photography be accurate, reliable, and verifiable. Verifiable. So effective correction at the time of capture 
is a really important element of the hat pair house photography. It corrects for camera distortion so that you get a, a, a real and true um, image of what that building looks like. And how do you establish that same authenticity with a digital image? There really aren't standardized processes among photographers, among photographers to um, you know, establish the authenticity. There's a lack of tools provided to anybody trying to do quality control on an image. And we have a couple of slides here. Um, this is, if you do not do perspective correction, looking up at a building, this is what you're going to see. The building becomes distorted. Um, by using a view camera and doing house-to-house -house photography, the building distortion is corrected at the time of capture in the camera. And you can do that, that you can sort of do that same perspective correction in Photoshop with a digital camera, but the problem is this is what happens. It looks like you've corrected the distortion in the building, but when you compare it to perspective correction on capture, you get a big difference. The, the, you know, the windows get stretched out, the lamp gets stretched out, and all you're really doing is kind of stretching pixels rather than actually accurately recording the building. Um, we do use digital photography, though, um, but in a, a different way than, than, you know, we use digital photography for field work. The architects can, can, can record uh, details of the building that they can then use to do the drawings. And in the level four survey, which Catherine will talk about in a little bit, we do use digital photography uh, as part of a, a, a survey work that has done. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Hatcher House is in the National Historic Preservation Act, um, and the Library of Congress. Is, um, is the repository that is designated in the National Historic Preservation Act. There is no other repository that is act um, of documentation. It's really important that that documentation come to the Library of Congress uh, you know, via the National. If the documentation is being deposited in another repository that's, that's not the Library of Congress, then I'm not sure that, that, that the mitigation being called for under the law is really being met. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanted to touch on, on that a little bit because mitigation is a, uh, really important to us because it's primary means by which documentation uh, has traditionally come to uh, the Library of Congress collection. Um, but I also uh, wanted to t take a, this opportunity to talk to you about um, I think many of you are probably likely aware of the re-engineering proposal uh, that was sent out in, in 1997. Um, in short, that proposal suggested that mitigation documentation in compliance to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act need only be undertaken for National Historic Landmarks, um, register sites indicated to be of national significance, or potentially even any site listed in the National Register, particularly, um, quote, some specifically identified individually eligible properties significant at the state and local levels, end quote. Um, what was meant by that latter statement is that property types determined to be already comprehensively documented within the existing Habs Hare House collection need not be recorded. Um, of course, this policy does overlook the need for regional um, variations in forms and styles among the various building types. Uh, and in fact, those types that were supposedly overrepresented and therefore not need to be recorded were never identified. Um, moreover, the policy was interpreted to mean that Habs Hare House and or the Library of Congress were no longer interested in the documentation of sites that were not National Historic Landmarks, uh, whether it be through mitigation or even just in uh, general donations or documentation into the collection. And um, I just wanted to reiterate that this is absolutely not true. Um, it was further stated that the policy would be reevaluated after five years, which never happened. Um, the new re-engineering policy also left it to the SHPOs 
to develop their own standards and guidelines for mitigation documentation of non-landmark quality sites and to provide um, for the storage of that documentation. Um, the myth that we are most anxious to dispel then is with regard to the acceptance of other than landmark structures, um, which seems to be fairly widespread. In fact, in a recent SurveyMonkey inquiry of federal preservation officers, um, we discovered that two-thirds of the respondents were not aware that we accept and in fact welcome documentation at all levels of significance. Um, I have heard that this is also a common belief uh, within, within many SHPOs. Okay. Um, one of the other uh, kind of, I guess, misconceptions that we wanted to get across to people is, is um, if you're putting documentation on a Hadsher House title block, or if you're using, you know, has as the, the, the name that you're putting on documentation, if it needs to be in the, the Hadd Care House collection at the Library of Congress. If it's not in the collection at the library, then it's not part of the Hadd Care House collection. Um, we really run into this a lot of, you know, people will contact the library because they see a citation of, you know, house documentation being done for a certain structure. Logically, they go to the Hadd collection at the Library of Congress it's not in the collection. It's being deposited in, you know, a state archive or some other repository. And then, you know, basically our answer to them is, well, HABS documentation was never done. We never received it. It's not in the collection. HABS documentation doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being very, very frustrating for the public coming to our collection, looking for documentation that they, that they think has been done. And it ends up wasting a lot of time with the Library of Congress staff and HABS Fair House staff trying to track down this documentation that doesn't exist. So if you're putting documentation on our title block or using the HAB's name for your documentation, it needs to go to the library. Um, as part of the um, 1997 memo, the re-engineering policy that Catherine had alluded to uh, just a minute ago, um, the result of that memo was that people thought we were no longer accepting mitigation documentation or any documentation really at all. Um, so when you look at the kind of statistics of how many transmittals we were getting for mitigation in 1998, you know, it was, it was over 1,100 um, surveys that were done as mitigation documentation. By 2006, that number had dropped to just 61. And I think that was really not the intention of the memo. Um, you know, among our, our big concerns with the declining number of sites recorded for the library and deposited in the library is the fact that mitigation is still being done. Um, it's just not being put in an archive that is publicly accessible or accessible online. You know, one of the big benefits of putting any mitigation documentation you're doing in the Library of Congress is that it's publicly accessible, it's online, you have a whole staff of librarians that are willing to, to help out researchers, and you have you know, state-of-the-art collection storage that the library provides really free of charge to, to, um, the document, to any producers of documentation. Yeah, and I also would like to add that it won't restrict your access to that material. In fact, it will be available to you to retrieve uh, any time, night, or day um, via the library's website. And, it, and we wanted to take this webinar as an opportunity to kind of open up a dialogue with um, the State Historic Preservation Offices, with the TIPOs, to find out what, what is your 106 mitigation process, you know, what is the criteria that your office uses to stipulate the level of documentation, who do you consult with, you know, kind of how that happens. I think it, it, it happens at a variety of different levels with different consulting parties, and it'd be really great for us all to get an understanding of how each other works, if we have some best practices that we can institute on a, on a wide scale, that would be really, really great. So any, any feedback from you guys as to what your process is and what's worked and doesn't work would, would be greatly appreciated. Um, sure. And it seems that when mitigation is uh, undertaken to have their house standards for transmittal to collection, 
it, it's generally being undertaken at level three, quote unquote, short reports and photographs. Um, so for those of you not really familiar with the levels of documentation, I wanted to run through them quickly and then maybe focus on the products that, that Chabot's, um traditionally um, could do and could contribute. Um, so level one recording, as you know, is the highest. It's national historic landmarks or NHL quality structures or maybe an intact example of a structure, the documentation of which would serve to capture an identifiable building type or a representative sample of that. Um, level one calls for comprehensive documentation that is a full set of measured drawings, uh, outline report, and thorough coverage through large format black and white photographs um, using color where appropriate. Um, and this is example, um, the woodland. It's among America's finest and first neoclassical houses. That's a good example of an NHL site that would require full documentation. Uh, you know, it's worthwhile to record um, the detailed measured drawings, photographs, and a, and a full outline report. Um, I just wanted to show you this outline if you're not familiar with it. Um, it provides a ready checklist of the information that should be provided, including physical history and historical context or narrative section feature-by-feature feature descriptive information and analysis of the site along with bi excuse me, bibliographic information. I mean, the idea is this sort of aids the student or the consultant in preparing the report. Um, that, and that's one of our objectives. Um, the Quan Quan Prudhomme House uh, is representative of a once pre prevalent Creole house form. So this is a good example of what I was referring to, um, of a vernacular building type that's worthy of comprehensive level one recording. Uh, of course, because it's not as elaborate as the Woodlands, its documentation was accomplished using much fewer sheets of drawings, photographs, and, and a shorter report. Um, I also wanted to share with you this example of a representative building type that was recorded comprehensively, but more sparingly, if you will. Um, Habs had actually, in this case, conducted a study of the Carnegie libraries that were built as part of the Free Library of Philadelphia system. Um, we recorded in all 22, the 22 extant libraries through short um, outline reports of about 15 pages each on average and about a dozen photographs. And then we just selected one of the libraries as a prototype to receive measured drawings. Um, because the Secretary of Standards documentation states that you're supposed to convey what is significant, most significant about the structure, uh, we focus the drawing component on the plan. Um, the plan, I think in any case, is going to be the most important, the single most important drawing um, because it illustrates how the building was used. In this case, it shows the open stacks, which were a unique feature of libraries at that time, um, pretty common now. Um, lecture halls and meeting rooms for community use. Um, and then the architectural style, which varied among the 22 libraries recorded, was less important. Um, and so elevations that show style were, we felt were better captured through the photographs. And there's a contact sheet to give you an idea of the photographs that were taken. And then an overview report um, was written, which is included in the documentation for the central library um, so that as I said, shorter individual um, reports were used to tell the stories of the individual uh, community libraries. Um, in some cases, frankly, you know, maybe one sheet of drawings uh, is all that's really needed. As I mentioned, you know, the floor plan is really the, the one element that is not easily uh, represented through the written word or in photographs. Um, and in fact, if you're, if you're not aware, we recently cre created the Lester Holland Prize, Lester Holland being the, our first archivist at the Library of Con Congress. And the idea was to encourage architectural professionals who are doing drawings as part of their uh, regular practice, usually for restoration purposes, and others whose time is limited to, um, to capture the essence of a building on a single sheet. So it sort of challenges the recorder to, to determine what's really most important and, and to show that. Um, level two recording um, is for, you know, building that may be landmark, maybe not quite, maybe of state significance. I, it differs mostly in level one in that it's usually applied 
where original drawings already exist. Um, and I'll show you, here's an example of the Bodie Island Lighthouse. This is an example of an appropriate use of measured drawings, um, which were copied onto our mylar and then accompanied with an historical report and large format pho photographs. Here's a, a close-up of the, one of the Bodie Island drawings. And original pre-existing drawings can be used and put on our mylar and submitted to the HAPS collection, but they, they, have to, they need to meet the Secretary of Interior standards. You know, they, they need to represent the structure as it now stands, um, to include some measurements, be very clear and concise, which can be really challenging with existing drawings. A lot of times they've been damaged or smudged or they have just haven't been stored very well, and the drawings aren't legible. And, and if they're not legible and you can't read them, then there's no point really to, to reproducing them on have drawings and having more illegible drawings in the collection. Um, one of the things that, that you can do, if you have pre-existing drawings, you can take them out in the field and, and greatly reduce your field time by using those drawings as, as kind of a base point for creating new drawings. Um, sometimes. You know, I mean, if you have the benefit of having drawings like the Scotty Island drawings, that's wonderful, and you can use them. But a lot of times, drawings that already exist are not good, mm -hmm. um, or, or there's been a lot of alterations since those drawings were were created, and then you have to go out in the field and and um, create new drawings that show the alterations. You can use the existing drawings as kind of a baseline again and, and show any additional alterations. Okay, um, level three, which seems to be the most popularly um, utilized, um, is capturing, generally should be used to capture a, a site of state or local significance, um, and, and it's particularly useful in recording vernacular endangered uh, structures, you know, we don't have a lot of time or resources. It includes a short format report, photographs, and an optional um, sketch plan. Um, so, sorry, am I doing wrong? Um, okay, here is an example of a mitigation documentation of a bungalow, um, and I'll talk more about it in a minute, but I just wanted to um, stress how important uh, the sketch plan is in conveying how the building was used and why it's important. Um, the sketch plan is optional, but again, I want to stress how important it is and, and that it, it, it should be uh, included wouldn't possible. Um, and the, uh, the short format report is an abbreviated version of the longer outline report. Um, and it can be as short as a single page. It's generally about two to four pages in length on average. Um, and it includes, as you can see here, more basic information, the name of the site, its location, the significant statement, and then brief description, descriptive and historical sections as well as, you know, citing sources used. Um, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. And then finally, the level four is it's intended really for survey or inventory purposes or for reconnaissance work in identifying which buildings of a type or within a particular region, excuse me, region, should be um, identified for a higher level of documentation. So it consists of the short form report which, um, if some of you are familiar with the old architectural data form, it's sort of taken the place of that or of an inventory card. And it often includes figure pages, um, which include uh, copies of historical images uh, or current digital photographs of the site. Um, but please, I just want to also mention that you should keep in mind that copyright, um, the collection is copyright free, so if you're using historic images, you may need to seek um, permission. Um, here are the documentation of the Enchanted Forest, a, a, a kitty amusement park, is an example where short, a short form report was in, included copies of color digital images that were printed out as figure pages. Um, we, just, we had a, a question from, from the callers, uh, from the participants about um, the use of the collection online and who uses the collection. Um, it's it's kind of hard to judge. Um, you know, we can we can download uh, user statistics and sort of from where the people are coming into the collection from, like what is referred to as a refer uh, when you're doing your web stats. You can see where people are 
coming from and who's referring them to the website. We do get a lot of .edu, so a lot of universities, a lot of schools are uh, referring people to our website. And whoever thinks is the primary user of the website is K-12 and university students. Um, they use it, you know, budding uh, architects use it as, as a, a, a study um, a study collection that they can look at different building types and look at um, patterns through time. Um, but there's, there's been some really interesting applications of Pat Care House. Uh, uh, movie Studios was one of the, the users that would come in and look at photographs and drawings of historic houses in order to recreate, um, you know, sets to use in movies. Uh, but we think really the primary audiences are students. We actually had an example not long ago where the, um, the University of Delaware taught a class um, and utilized the HABS collection as the basis for that. They were, they were um, asked to create uh, stylistic profiles and building typologies, and they were, used, they were to use the collection um, to identify representative types. And so that was interesting. Okay. Well, I just want to say that while, um, while the HABS Care Health programs I uh, would like to see more measured drawings reproduced for the collection. We realize that it does take time and money to do so. And frankly, not every site rises to the uh, level of full-scale measured drawings. Um, however, during the course of conducting field surveys and recording sites, um, particularly those that are endangered, and um, SHPO's or SHPO offices often produce a sketch plan or another uh, rough drawings on graph paper. Um, and this is an example of measured sketches that Bob Gamble from the Alabama SHPO office has shared with me. And I'm going to work with him to create short form reports. But, you know, you, you, can, you can include these kind of sketches, as I said, along with a short report that can just be a, a page or two um, as a way of including it in the Habsare House collection. Um, because really the value of our collection is predicated on the conclusion of American building forms of all types and from all regions of the country. Um, and because regionally and ethnically derived building forms are of particular mm -hmm. interest, uh, uh, we really depend upon um, data start preservation offices um, as well as students and private sector individuals and organizations to contribute to the collection. I mean, you know your sites and structures, um, your region better than anyone else. Um, it would be extremely valuable to architectural scholars and to the American public in general if at least a representative sampling of your state structures were included in the Habs Hair House collection. If not comprehensively, at least in this manner, um, it really was the intent of the Habs program when it was formed in 1933. Um, as well as uh, the intent of the mitigation requirements as outlined by the National Historic Preservation Act, that it be the national repository. Um, and as we've already touched upon, it can provide state-of-the-art stewardship for your records. So if you've got uh, drawings and sketch plans taking up lots of space in your file cabinets and flat files, um, we know where you can send them. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, show you quickly, run through some examples of survey level projects um, where large format photographs and short format reports were undertaken by HABs in conjunction with SHPOs um, who made the actual selection of the site. Um, some of the projects were undertaken as a means of creating uh, regional or state representation within the collection and some, you know, to basically fill in the gaps um, in existing documentation. Here in South Carolina, numerous sites um, representing both the state, industry, and architecture were captured. Um, in Massachusetts, the SHPO uh, selected a theme of community and public um, accessibility, so identifying and recording those structures they felt were um, benefit the Commonwealth. Um, in Minnesota, we work with the SHPO who chose to have all their National Historic Landmarks um, recorded and included in the Library of Congress collection. And we've been, we're still working with the Maryland State Historic Preservation Office to do, conduct county-by-county county surveys um, that will ultimately be used in the Society of Architectural Historian Buildings of the U.S. series for Maryland, but, you know, also to fill in the gaps and for general recording purposes. 
Um, so in, in addition to feeding the Habitare Health Collection, um, the high-quality, large-format photographs um, in all these cases were used to create publications, brochures, um, and exhibitions, and um, materials that could be used for public education and advocacy. Um, so, in any way, in closing, um, I hope that we have dispelled a, a few a myths about the Habitat Health Program, um, opened a dialogue with regard to mitigation documentation, and perhaps got you thinking about the Library of Congress collection as a repository for some of your documentation. Um, we'd be glad to talk to you uh, more about these topics and others, so feel free to contact um, either of us. So there, our information is there on the screen, um, as, as well as uh, our Habs Hair House website and the uh, web address for the Library of Congress collection. Um, so most importantly, remember that we are very much interested in sites and structures at all levels of significance. Um, vernacular architecture has always formed the backbone of the HAB collection, and we want to ensure that that really important tradition continues. Um, so if anybody has any other questions or comments, um, please type them in, enter them. We're here. We're here. We have been, uh, just so you guys know, we have been recording this session, and We'll hopefully, if, if all goes well with the recording, we've had some technical difficulties with a couple webinars in the past, but hopefully the recording will, go, will be successful and we will post it on our website um, as soon as it becomes available so you guys can, can download it and share and revisit. We have a question uh, from the field about what's the process for submitting items. Uh, I'm the collections manager, Ann Mason, so my email is up there. Um, and you can also call me 202-354-2250 is my phone number. Feel free to call me. And um, we gladly accept any donations. If you, you want us to work with you with regards to mitigation, we can, we can um, do that as well. Um, but feel free to send them my way, and I will gladly uh, accession them into the collection. Okay, well, I guess if there aren't any more uh, questions, um, you have our contact information um, and some food for thought. So hopefully... Uh, Hello there. Um, I actually do have a question. Okay. Um, this is Brian in the Southeast region. Um, having worked on a hair recording project a long time ago, I was just wondering what, what are the sites that were selected this year, this summer, for the summer program for um, hair? And if, if it's more than a few, you don't have to list them all, but where are some of the... Um, more interesting ones. I know we're working on a NASA project in Huntsville. I'm not sure exactly what structures they're documenting this year. Mm -hmm. um, that must be the rocket. Yeah, we've been doing quite, yeah. quite a bit of, of work for NASA, so we, we may have more than one site. I think we've been working in, in California as well. Um, and I think the, uh, the covered bridge project is still continuing. We've been doing that, identifying and and actually then landmarking um, some of uh, the, the covered bridges. Um, mm -hmm. The Cairo, um, the Civil War era um, ship. Yeah, the ironclad that's at uh, Vicksburg. We're right. Finished, yeah, we're finishing that documentation. Um, and then there, there are some maritime sites, too, that Hare's been working on, but I can't think of the names of the Muffins. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? 
Um, otherwise, as I was saying, uh, please think of us as a resource, and um, and uh, we'll hope to be speaking with you soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks.